Good morning, everyone. Today, here we have Professor uh, Isabel Marouche, that has a PhD in chemical engineering and, and, and is, since 2020, a full professor at the Institute Superior Technic from Universidad de Lisboa. Uh, Dr. Isabel Marouche's research interests are sustainable extraction processes using ionic liquids and polyionic liquids. And that is the topic that she's going to discuss and present us a little bit about. So uh, the presentation is entitled Separations Using Finally Ionic. Thank you, Professor. The stage is yours. <laughs> uh, thank you so much uh, for inviting me to be here today. It's a true pleasure. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, separations using polyionic liquids. But in between, I'm going to talk about different things. Um, so this is where I live. Uh, this is the, oh, let me go back. So this, this is not IST, as you all know. IST is this uh, complex up here. And this is the um, chemical tower, chemical engineering tower. So this is where I live. I live here in this corner. So this is the tower, and this is my group at several um, stages. Uh, some of these photos were not taken uh, at IST. I'm only in IST for five years now. It's five years now, uh, before I was in other institutes. Um, and so I think that it, it's rather in just talking to you about uh, what uh, uh, what my research is, about my research, I'd like to talk to you about a little bit uh, of my path, my academic and scientific path. So I did uh, my ST, uh, my, um, my degree and uh, my PhD at IST, um, and I'm only uh, focusing that because now I came back to IST. And this is for uh, professors at IST, it's quite strange because I think that I am the only one that was not born and lived here during most of their lives. And so it is strange for me to have gone out and then coming back. Um, I did most of my, of my PhD studies in the uh, United States, in Colorado School of Mines. Uh, and that for me was very good because it taught me a great thing about how to work independently and uh, to um, listen to other people's problems in terms of scientific problems, of course, uh, and try to interact with different people in scientific terms. So when I came back from the United States with my PhD, I tried to find a job, a position in a university, and I taught for one year in Lisbon in the pharmacy school. Uh, I taught physical chemistry. And then finally a position opened at the University of Aveiro and I moved to Aveiro. And um, I think that at that point, 1998, my hopes were that um, I would stay in Aveiro for the rest of my life. That was what I thought it was going to, to happen. Um, as you all know, I got hired at the same time as Professor João Coutinho, and that's how, and we, we were put in the same office together, and that's how we found path. Uh, because we were together, we had common interests, and we just took the chance of uh, building something together. And those were very nice years. Uh, while I was in Aveiro, um, we built a, a strong group. Um, yeah, I'm very proud to have started that group, although I do not uh, participate anymore uh, in, um, in the group. But I am very proud because um, I think it shows that uh, um, even a small university in a small country can put a mark in the world. And that is very important for, for us Portuguese, and especially for you that are young scientists starting. Um, then for personal reasons, I had to move to Lisbon. Uh, so I moved to Lisbon, I moved to ITTB. And at that point, I did the thing that everybody told me not to do, which was to leave uh, my position at University of Aveiro and to take a chance as a researcher in a research institute. Uh, so I had contracts, five-year contracts for um, seven years, eight years, and uh, that was very hard. And I'm just sharing this with you because I know that most of you are probably at this stage of the career. Uh, it was hard because um, the scientific careers in Portugal are not very well structured and defined. But uh, what we should all have in mind is that uh, 
if we believe in what we're doing and what, and if we strive for excellence, uh, we'll always have a place in the in the scientific world, in the academic world. There will always be a place for us. Um, after being at ITTV for eight years, uh, this research institute became more. So this is Instituto de Tecnologia Química e Biológica. It became more biological than chemistry. The chemistry group really shrunk, and I felt that I did not fit there anymore. And so I decided to start applying for new positions, and I got this position at IST. I am at, I am at IST now for five years, um, and so it was uh, quite a challenge. So I'm always starting over. I, most of the times I say that I'm like a gypsy, because from when you move from one place to the other, you carry hardly no equipment, hardly no students, and so it's really a starting over. Uh, but starting over is also good because it gives you new, new challenges and uh, that's how I think that we should face life. So I thought that my plan for life was like a straight line, but my plan for life was not a straight line. As you all know that are in your, uh, doing your scientific career, managing things that sometimes you think we would, you would have a lot of success and success is not easy. We have some, uh, uh, some, sometimes that we have to take take a, a boat. There's sometimes that we have to use a bridge. There's sometimes that we have to use a ladder. But the idea is not to stay in the bottom, is to use all these things and to think, if I am here, there is a way out. And find your way out. You have to, uh, to find your way out. And that was my message for the path group, especially. I'm not talking about polyionic liquid. My interest with polyionic liquids was really um, um, was really interesting because I met a professor from San Sebastián in a conference that offered me a bunch of polyelectrolytes, a bunch of polyionic liquids. And so that's how I started to become interested in polyelectrolytes, more specific in polyionic liquids. So polyionic liquids are a special class of polyelectrolytes and polyelectrolytes can be classified according to three uh, categories. The first is origin, and most people do this. They can be natural or synthetic. And in the natural, we all have the DNA, as you all know. And in the synthetic, we have uh, um, PVA, for example, as you all know also here that are displayed here. In terms of the matrix, they can be linear, they can be branched, and they can be cross-linked. When we have branched, when they have branched, cross-links, when we have ionic interactions between the branch that are so strong that uh, keep the polymer in a specific shape. In terms of charge, they can be cationic if the backbone of the polymer is cationic, anionic if the backbone of the polymer is anionic, polyampholytes, if they have in the backbone both positive charges and negative charges. And then uh, it really depends on how our negative charges are, if they are on the side chains, if they are on the main chain. And this makes our polymer be, uh, have specific mechanical properties that we'll discuss in a bit. So how do we prepare polyelectrolytes? Um, typically, we prepare polymer electrolytes in two ways. One is a bottom-down approach where we pick up an ionic liquid monomer and we polymerize it, and we get a polymerized ionic liquid. Um, there is also a top-down approach, which is the functionalization. So I, I pick up a polymer, but a neutral polymer, and I functionalize it in a way that I get charges. Typically, I introduce, um, um, I do an alkylation of a group, and that's how I pick up the charges. Uh, it is very difficult to make uh, this first step, this bottom-up uh, polymerization, uh, to prepare polyionic liquids to prepare membranes, because typically they are of low molecular weight, and so they are not filmogenic. I cannot make films with them. And so typically we'd rather go with this second approach. 
Um, so what, how do we do it? So we have, um, we have uh, or uncharged polymers or anionic polyelectrolytes or cationic polyelectrolytes. So if we have uncharged, we just functionalize it. As I told you, we, we make an alkylation in these groups that are here. If we already have anionic or cationic polyelectrolytes, we just do an anion exchange. So we just replace, for example, this sodium by the NTF2 anion, for example. Um, okay. Um, so what have I done with polyionic liquids? We've used polyionic liquids for a lot of things. Um, we use them for uh, membranes for gas separation. That's typically what we use them for. And I'm going to show you in a bit that they perform very well. Uh, we've, always, we've also used them for solid phase microextraction, which is another thing that I'm going to talk about also, because we have some very interesting results that we are still publishing. And with this solid phase microextraction, we started to realize that we needed porosity. And that for us was very important. And with these materials, we also prepared materials uh, for absorption of water pollutants. In another vein, uh, we also did aqueous biphasic systems. You can do aqueous biphasic systems using polymers. All of you that use aqueous biphasic systems, sometimes you use polymers, you use uh, PPG, PEG, and so on, uh, and you know that they can be used, uh, although um, they have a big disadvantages, which is the systems become quite viscous due to the, um, to the, molecular, uh, to the mo uh, molecular weight of the polymer. So we did a couple of papers on this, and then we abandoned it. Um, we can also use it for virus purification, and this is, was an interesting uh, vein that uh, we did uh, when I entered IST uh, in collaboration with Professor Raquel Arjbarros, uh, that we used uh, aqueous biphasic systems and these adsorption materials that we prepared here for virus purification to absorb either the virus or the impurities. And it worked quite well. Nevertheless, our focus has been membranes for gas separation, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. And we also have some very interesting so results on solid phase microextraction, and I'm going to focus on that also. Okay, so as I already told you, um, polyionic liquids are polymerized ionic liquids. Uh, when I entered this field of polymers, and in particular polymer, uh, polymeric ionic liquids, I was coming from the field of ionic liquids. And so the idea was to take advantage of all the properties that ionic liquids have, like the design and nature, which for me it's the most important property of ionic liquids, the high ionic content and does the affinity properties of ionic liquids to develop polymers that have the same properties, but now have properties of solids also. So they don't drip when I use them. I have improved mechanical stability and improved processability that are given by the macromolecular structure of polymers. So this is what we are combining. We are combining properties of ionic liquids with the properties of polymers. So these are the two, um, the two topics that I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, so I, I'm going to pick up this one, and this, this topic is more material science and chemistry, and I think it, it will be of your interest. So solid phase microextraction, typically SPME, uh, it's, a, it's a sampling method that has been used for a long time. And it has been used specifically uh, because it is non-invasive and it has a high limit of a very low limit of detection. It has been used in uh, for food, in food applications, in the purity of uh, chemicals, in the study of wildlife, or even, for instance, uh, in uh, agriculture to know when uh, fruits are ripen and things like that. And also, of course, in medicine. More and more now, uh, we need non-invasive techniques uh, that can detect uh, uh, biomarkers. For example, there are a lot of biomarkers uh, that are present in our breath. Human breath is a source of 
like lung cancer biomarkers, uh, diabetes, um, uh, asthma, and many other diseases. So uh, biomarkers that we can detect we using SPME. So how does SPME work? So SPME works uh, because we have a coating. This coating here on this silica support is the heart and soul of solid phase microextraction. So we have this coating here. Can you see my uh, mouse? Hopefully, yes. Um, so we have this coating, it's here, it's on a plunger, and uh, the pl it is in the, on the top of a needle. So what I do is I have my sample here, and this is a liquid sample, but if it was a breath sample, I would have a breath bag, which is a bag that is impermeable to gases, and it keeps breath of the patients inside. Uh, so I put here, I put the, the syringe here and I expose my fiber. And when I expose my fiber to the headspace of the sample, it sorbs the compounds. And then I take the, need, the, the plunger out, the syringe out, and I put it in the GC inlet. So that with temperature, I desorb my compounds that go through a GC column and are detected. Um, a technique as important as this, we would think that there would be a lot of commercial fibers, but apparently there's not very many commercial fibers, only a couple of them. I show you here three, and very recently there's been an update in uh, solid phase commercial fibers because they have introduced carboxane. And carbons, carboxane is a carbon, so it adds porosity to the fiber and it also leverages polarities. So when I have um, a fiber that is a polymer and a carbon, so uh, uh, a carbon matrix, I have absorption because of the porous and absorption because of the polymer. But most of the fibers that you see here, they are just polymeric and they just absorb. And now they're starting to appear some that also absorb and absorb through the introduction of this carboxane here. Okay, so um, this is what we were, uh, this is what, what, where we try to contribute. So what are these problems? The problem with adsorbent fibers is that it physically traps or chemical reacts with the analytes. I have a porous uh, material and I have a high surface area. Uh, however, these fibers may have limited capacity. Uh, when I have an absorbent fiber, the analytes are extracted, are absorbed into the polymer. And so these fibers have higher capacity because they, although they have a small area exposed, they have a higher volume to absorb. So what we are wanting is to combine both of these worlds. So this is uh, a work that one of my PhD students uh, did. Uh, David Patinha. David now is a process chemist at Scion, and he designs um, fibers for, for SPME and for um, new techniques for S NMR. And uh, he did essentially four types of fibers, the thick, the thin, the thick we wanted to take advantage of volume, the thin we wanted to, to narrow down the volume and increase surface area, Particles also, a lot of surface area, and porous in the end, a lot of surface area also. Okay, so let's focus on the thick coatings. Uh, as you all know, I'm not uh, an organic chemist, and so of course, in all these projects, I had the collaboration with uh, the people from San Sebastian. Um, and what we did here, it was we used this polymer, the uh, so this is a well-known this is a well-known polymer that we have been using, and we just do, did uh, commercial, and we just did the ring closing um, reaction, but we did it using UV light. So we have this mold, and it is a glass mold. We fill it with the poly, the polymer solution, polymer in acetone. We put here what is going to be our handle. And we radiate it with UV light for a certain amount of time. In the end, we just put this in a solution of HF to dissolve the mold, and we get our fiber. Uh, this handle here, how did we get it? 
we had a couple of uh, colleagues that work on SPME, and we used their uh, or used SPME fibers. We just burned the fiber and we kept the handle so that it would fit inside of the GC. So we prepared three polymers, and here are the fibers that we prepared. Uh, we have the disadvantage of having always the same thickness because the thickness is controlled by the mold, uh, 67 micrometers. And so let's take a look of the results. Um, here are the results. So here we compare our fibers, the top three, these three, with the commercial fibers, the yellow and the black. So we are comparing polymeric fibers with polymeric fibers. Um, and uh, we used a bunch of um, standard uh, compounds to compare these fibers. What we can see here in the total peak area is that we absorb more compounds than the commercial fibers. What we can see here in this down graph by, compare, by comparing each one of the compounds is that it looks like that we typically are sorbing at least the P, uh, when we have a carbon-14 uh, in the side chain, that it sorbs more compounds than all of the other fibers. Um, what we did uh, also was to use urine spiked just to have the matrix effect, because this some were done in commercial uh, in uh, water, some were done in urine spiked with uh, these compounds. Uh, we have. So we have, if the fiber was stable over 100 injections, this is very important. So we sampled and inject and analyzed 100 times. Uh, the reproducibility was uh, 90%, and it was the same for PA and PDMS. And we have a low limit of detection, and we have a high reproducibility. However, these fibers were not what we had in mind, because they were too thick. Um, and what is, we saw that we let the fibers to sorb, and it took a long time for them to sorb and to desorb. And so we decided to do thin coatings. In the thin coatings, this was a collaboration with India. We, we had a project with India on this, again, with an organic chemistry group. Um, and here we use a spray coating. So we, here we have the same solution, a solution of our polymer. And here we have polymers with different groups. Uh, we have the, an alkyl chain, we have a phenyl group, and we have an ethyl group. We just spray yeah. over the fiber and uh, we, uh, in a hot oven so that it, it is, the solvent is evaporated immediately. And we got a very thin coating between 8 and 10 micrometers. So let's see what the results. Uh, this time we used three, uh, the, the three polymers that we prepared, and this time we used it in soil. So we had soil, we picked up soil, we um, uh, spiked the soil with these three compounds, and then we exposed the soil inside of a, a vial to uh, our fiber. And this is the result that we got. So we are, we are again comparing our fibers with commercial fibers in white, PDMS, again, polymer with polymer. This is a very well-known mixture, BETEX. And uh, uh, BETEX is typically used, um, uh, BETEX is typically, typically tested to know if the soil is contaminated by gasoline or by fuel. And this is why we used soil. What we can see here is that, um, in fact, we are doing also much better than the commercial fiber that we compared to. Uh, the, the one that has the naphtyl group, no, the one that has the alkyl group was the better one. Uh, the fiber was also stable over 100 injections. And we think that this happened through PP interactions. And uh, how, although it might seem very strange, these two polymers, the one that has the benzyl group and the naphtyl group, do not have as much interaction with our compounds because we think that they interact among themselves. And so they are very dense and they do not allow the compounds to penetrate. 
most interesting thing is that we started to realize that the thin would also not work also very well because I have very small volume. And so I expose the fiber for a very limited period of time and the fiber is already saturated. Um, these uh, samples that we have been using were done in, um, uh, were done uh, all at the same concentration, but if I have a very small concentration, I would never be able to detect the compounds in very small concentration. So here we did it with particles. And what we did it was we just used brute force. We made the polymer, we ground it, and we glued with silicon to a neutral fiber. And here is the looks of our fiber. Of course, that this was a little bit naive for us to do. Um, but at that time, it was what uh, we were, we tried to do to see if we could go forward with porosity or not. Um, and we did, we tested these samples um, in, um, we tested these samples with, uh, with alcohols. And here, as you can see, uh, we are doing quite well with alcohols. We tested them with the BTEX mixture. And we do also quite well with the BTEX mi mixture. But the problem with these fibers is that they were only stable over 50 injections. And the re re reproducibility was very low because we kept on losing particles from our fiber. So although the results are interesting, um, the... the the, the fiber is not very stable. So I'm going to skip this and I'm going to go to porous coatings. The porous coatings was again a cooperation with a university in Sweden uh, with Professor Yain Yuan. And uh, here what we did is we, we used a polyionic liquid and a polyelectrolyte and we activated the polyelectrolyte by a pH change. So we have here our polymer and our polyacrylic acid and we uh, prepare them. So we have a stainless steel wire. We itched it with HCl solution. We coated it with this solution uh, with the polymeric ionic liquid and the polyacrylic acid. We put it, it in an ammonia solution for four hours. And what we did, it was we ionized the polyacrylic acid. So it cross-linked with our pill and at the same time, the one that was not cross-linked was washed out by the solution, leaving us with porous. So we, here we have the different times that we had it, the, 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 the wire coated inside of the ammonia solution. And only with four hours, we got the, the, the porous. Uh, so we have here the FTIR to prove that we have some um, some, uh, some groups, some carboxylic groups that uh, are uh, protonated, some that are not protonated, and here the porosity of our samples. Um, so here we tested with a very wide range of compounds, and we can see uh, between the porous and the non-porous that we gained a lot in using the porous, and the, uh, the porous versus the non-porous. The porous opens up more surface and fastens the, uh, the, the, the absorbance or the sorbents of our uh, compounds. Uh, of course, that those that are more uh, sorbed are those that have uh, higher vapor pressure. Um, and we, here we have absorption versus absorption. And here we used one of the new commercial fibers by Supelco that also has carbon. And we can see that uh, we have a much higher peak areas than they do. So we are working on the right direction. So let me now just talk briefly guess, about gas separation membranes. This might, see, might uh, be, look like to you that these are very uh, distinct subjects. They're not. They go hand in hand and all the improvements that we have done on one side it's because we have made improvements on the other side. Uh, when we started doing gas separation membranes, what we did was dense membranes, which can be compared to those first SPME fibers that we did. Uh, then in the SPME fibers, we had the need to evolve to porosity. And that's how gas separation membranes is also involved, evolving, is to introduce porosity. 
Okay. So, um, as you all know, um, gas separation membranes are not still at the top of the preferred technologies in industry to separate gases. And uh, that is because the membranes for gas separation have not still evolved in a way that they can compete with absorption. Nevertheless, they have a lot of advantages because they are compact and very easy to operate. They are less energy intensive, and here's where they, where they gain to the absorption uh, technologies. They can be very easily coupled with other separation technologies to enhance efficiency. Um, however, they have the disadvantage that the, the complete separation is rare, and this is, that is why we need to couple membranes with other technologies. And the high pressure and temperature conditions might be a temperature for polymeric membranes. For, uh, for um, inorganic membranes, that is not the problem. Okay, so what we are doing is the development of materials, uh, the development of materials that are CO2 selective. And we have been doing this because of, for energy purposes, we all know that our society is based on energy. And so we really need to come up with ways to take CO2 out of uh, most of the processes, most of, most of the, the exhaust gases. It's also very important for it to be used. Um, we cannot just uh, use CO2 when it's contaminated with other gases. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to show to you here today is the separation of CO2 from hydrogen in the perspective that we can have very uh, different types of hydrogen, brown hydrogen, gray hydrogen, blue hydrogen, and green hydrogen. Um, the, what we are talking about in Portugal is gray hydrogen that is produced from industrial processes, or blue hydrogen that is from carbon fuel derived hydrogen, CCS. But what I'm going to show to you today is about green hydrogen or biohydrogen that have completely different operation, operation conditions than those other two, the gray and the blue. So biohydrogen, uh, we have around 57 to 60% of hydrogen when shifted syn gas as 45. And the conditions are, the, it is produced at 30 and four, four to 40 degrees C while shifted syn gas is more than 200 degrees C and the pressure is one bar while the pressure for the thin gas is between 20 and 25 bars. So this seems like to be a very nice application for our membranes, at least to test our membranes and see what comes up. So here is again this duality that I was talking to you about before. Uh, shall I have it dense and non-porous? Shall I have it completely porous? Um, so we evolved from the dense and now we are here because we cannot do porous symmetric membranes starting from polymers because all the gases have very much the same um, kinetic diameter. And so it is very difficult to produce porous that have different pore size to differentiate between the gases. So what we are aiming is, we are trying to create a dense layer on top, very very thin so that the gas just takes very uh, few little time to pass from the uh, from the top to the bottom and then i have this pro this porous uh, support that is just supporting our very thin membrane and with that i can have very different permeation mechanisms i can even combine some of these mechanisms what it would be the ideal is to combine the mechanism of the dense with the with the nuts and diffusion, and that's what we are what we are aiming at. So this is the work of Andrea Govaya that I'm going to talk about today, and Andrea is almost finishing her PhD. I'm just going to show you here today some um, uh, mixture gas mixtures um, um, separation. So we are going to pick up a, CO, a mixture that has CO2, H2, and nitrogen, which are the main components of syn gas. And we are going to use the polymeric ionic liquids that we have been using here for gas separation. So as I told you, I'm not um, an organic chemist. 
And so what we do here is we buy uh, this polyelectrolyte with chloride, and then I just do an ion exchange. And here, an ion exchange also. We've already tested and know that NTF2 is the best ion combined with CCN3 are the best ions to perform gas separation, CO2 gas separation. And so those are the ones that we are going to use here. Okay, so this is uh, the apparatus that we use. We use this in collaboration with the University of Cantabria, uh, Santander. And we did this at several temperatures and fit pressures. And what we can see from here is that in multi-component gas mixtures, we have a significant reduction in both the permeabil in permeability of CO2 and H2. As you can see here, it changes from one to, uh, 129 to 209 and from 15 to 25. And uh, so there is uh, maybe because uh, they are competing with each other. Um, and with each other and with nitrogen, because we have a lot of nitrogen. We cannot forget about that. Uh, and then here we have the separation efficiency, and this is the good news, is that the separation efficiency is more or less the same. So if now we talk about the, the Robson plot, and the Robson plot is where we evaluate how good we are, we are doing, these are um, the results. Uh, in terms of the separation efficiency, in terms of the permeability of CO2, which is the most permeable gas. In terms of temperature, we see that we have a reduction of temperature when, when we go from the low temperature to the high temperature. And in terms of pressure, we can see that we also have a reduction, but a little reduction compared to that of temperature when we use different feed pressures. Okay, so I wanted to show you, uh, maybe I do not have time anymore. I'll skip this. And then if somebody would like to talk to me about this before, these are interpenetrative networks. Uh, and if somebody wants to talk to me about this afterwards, I will be willing to talk to you about them. But now let's go to the, por to the porous uh, pill heel membranes to make the comparison between the dense and the porous, just like I did in the analytical techniques. So we have the dense film, and what we are trying to aim is the dense top layer with the porous support. You might wonder why I don't just put the porous support here, because it is very hard then to glue these two different materials. And that's why we're trying to do both of it in one step uh, for the same polymer. Let me tell you that this has already been done to a couple of electrolytes and other polymers for um, mem membrane for separations, but typically of liquid-liquid separations, not uh, gas separations. So we are using the same uh, polymers that we used before, and we just do our casting as we would do for to prepare dense films, and then we let to evaporate and we let to evaporate for a very short period of time so that we create our top dense layer, and then we put it inside of the non-solvent. And we put it inside of the non-solvent to uh, take out all the solvent that we have inside, and then we just put the membrane in an oven to dry. So in fact, what we are trying to do is we are trying to enter here where I have the polymer dissolved in the solvent, and we use a non-solvent. When we use a non-solvent, our system starts to go from this point here, enters the two-phase equilibria, and at the end of the day, when all the solvent and the non-solvent is exchanged, we end up here, with, we end up in the D, the D point. Now, the trick is to choose the solvent and the non-solvent. When I have a non-solvent that has a low miscibility in the solvent, so we have slow exchanges and we end up in the, a porous structure that has a sponge-like morphology. When we have a solvent that has a high miscibility with the solvent, we, do, we have a fast exchange between the solvent and the non-solvent and we end up with finger-like structure. So we have to uh, optimize all these parameters. So here are the phase diagrams that we've been uh, carrying out. 
And now let me show you the pictures. So this is just of uh, being inside of the bath for uh, being exposed to the air. So forming the thick layer for five, 10, 20 and 40 minutes. And what we can see here is that we have the creation of porosity inside of the membrane. This is the top, they are all dense, and we have the creation of porosity inside the membrane. What happened is that this membrane seems very nice. These are the membranes. They are not transparent anymore. They, are, they have color, but they are very fragile uh, and they break uh, as you touch them, as you manipulate them, they break inside of the apparatus. Now, if we look at the other uh, example with another solvent, we can see here that we have pores on top and in the bottom, in, inside of the membrane, this is a cut. And, but these membranes are flexible, they don't break. And so we can measure uh, the permeability uh, of these membranes. So we have here the comparison for CO2 and then 2 of the dense membranes and um, the, the membranes that I've been talking to you about. So these are the porous membranes, and this is always solvent 2, solvent 2, and this is the ratio to the non-solvent, okay, the non-solvent. And so what, uh, what we can see is that the permeability is much larger, of course, because they are porous, and so the gas just flow, flies through. However, the selectivity, which here was around uh, 12 or 30, the selectivity goes down, and the selectivity is down, and selectivity is down. And here, this is the first membrane that we have that we think it might be a, a truly asymmetric membrane. So with the top layer and the porous support, the, the selectivity is going a little bit up, but it's coming down to values of the dense membrane. And here it's the same, so the permeability is improving, but the separation is still much lower than the dense membrane. So this is the, the, the trade-off. If we increase permeability, we lose on selectivity. And this is the balance that we are trying to keep up here. Okay, so the main conclusions of my work are these that the creation of porous in dense materials is a very versatile strategy to enhance the sorption of anything, being gas, being um, comp other compounds. You can also put them inside of a solution to sorb. So porosity is uh, nowadays very in. It's uh, a new field. Um, all these tests on the two applications revealed that uh, the extractions are, are much more efficient if we use porosity. Um, and so, and this is a little bit what is happening also in the field of ionic liquids with like supporting ionic liquids on porous nanoparticles. And I come to the end of my presentation. I would like to acknowledge all my students. Thank you for your patience. And I will be willing to ask all the questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I don't know if someone has some questions. They are all tired. So the right of some. <laughs> maybe that's a, a different field, and maybe people don't feel that comfortable. Um, actually, I invited the professor because I I wrote a, a chapter a book chapter regarding pills, and I didn't have much knowledge about it. That's why I chose you for this uh, palestra because I needed to know a little bit more because I know there's not much information regarding the synthesis, even the the whole definition of pills is still a little controversial sometimes. I don't know if you have something to say about the definition or even synthesis because it's, you said that the bottom up is it's top top down it's this the the the, the, the professor uses, right? Uh, yes, yes. I mean, if you are an organic chemist or if you have an organic chemist in your group, uh, it's easier for you to ask for, for them to prepare new polymers. The fact is that uh, it's very hard to prepare um, 
polymers, polymeric ionic liquids with uh, high molecular weight, like around 200,000. Typically, what are prepared are polymers that are around 50,000, and they do not have filmogenic properties. They, so you cannot prepare films from them. And this was quite obvious to us uh, because uh, uh, we, had, uh, we had a European project. We participated in a European project on the application of pills um, for very different applications. I mean, some people were doing uh, artificial skin, artificial muscles, uh, some people, so the networks that I was, I did not show to you, were coming from that project. They do artificial muscles with that. And we use them for gas separation. Um, uh, and uh, for their application, it would be fine. But for us, uh, it, it, we could not prepare membranes with that. And the minute that we just uh, added a little bit of a polymer with a, with a higher molecular weight, we had membranes again. Um, so yes, this is a different field. Regarding uh, the the um, sorry, sorry, go on, go on. Let, let I, me I just let me just uh, uh, um, say another thing. Uh, but there is a field in between that is very important, and it's uh, very easy. Um, that is to prepare gels. And uh, you can very easily prepare gels with ionic liquids and just a little bit of polymeric ionic liquids. Um, and this is perhaps a field in between where uh, if you have in your group some applications where uh, the liquid state is really complicating, perhaps the preparation of a gel, which is very easy, could be a solution. Okay, maybe we can go to Diogo. Diogo has a question, so go ahead. Hello, sorry for the mask. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was uh, really good. Uh, I was wondering how do these membranes compare to palladium uh, gold membranes for hydrogen selectivity? Okay. <clears throat> Um, it, it, they are completely different membranes, right? Of course, that uh, palladium membranes are uh, better uh, because you can, uh, um, they are chemistry made. So you can really uh, tune the pores of a palladium membrane to separate gases. The disadvantage of palladium membranes, so in terms of separation, they are better. You can, they are better uh, um, separation coefficients. They, um, they do not melt. So in terms of mechanical properties, they are good. However, they are expensive, they are fragile, and they are easily poisoned. And that's why they are still not in industry. Yeah. And there's also a leaching from palladium, so yeah. Yeah, so, so I mean, it's like, um, Perhaps there will be advances on that field on other membranes, uh, in organic membranes, cheaper membranes that can be take, taken to industry. I believe that uh, these polymeric membranes are go always going to be cheaper, uh, but they will have problems uh, at high temperatures. Uh, unless we start to have like a support that is uh, inorganic, and then we have these membranes, but they're going to melt. I don't believe that we'll have membranes that will not have complicated issues at high temperatures. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. How do you see the um, poly polyionic liquids future regarding the applications? For example, the, the thing that I, I, did, uh, I still don't know is that uh, uh, polyionic liquids have studies regarding ecotoxicity or toxicity overall. Just to know if they can be um, not that I know of. not studied. Not that exactly. I know of. Um, not that I know of. In fact, I think it would be uh, very interesting to do um, not uh, not uh, not earlier. Uh, now I'm changing subjects. It would be very interesting to have recyclable uh, if they to know if they are recyclable or not. Oh, exactly. Or to maybe develop recycling techniques. Yes. 
Exactly. At least reuse the fiber and then remove the coating and reuse the fiber or the support, the solid support. Uh, Maybe that, there will be a nice approach. Yes, 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 yes. I think that that should be that should be envisaged, and I think it's not been done yet. And in terms of polymeric ionic liquids, I think there's nothing done yet. Exactly, because the professor mentioned that there was a group using pills to make a synthetic skin or organs or all of that. So that makes me wonder that they should have some toxicity perhaps. tests. Otherwise, there will be... Perhaps, perhaps. Yeah, the, those are, uh, they, they, were, uh, they were more like, um, how shall I say, mechanical parts. So not necessarily to put inside the organ yeah, exactly. or the human like, body, like like, a, like um, to mimic skin and to have uh, to mimic movement, but not to ah, be okay, yes. the skin. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that's 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 the the thing that I noticed that is probably missing in this field. That's the toxicity and the, these tests in order to use these pills with other aims with our applications even even on the human body or other types of testings regarding cellular uh, cultures uh, I, and so I on. think so, I think so. I mean, in fact, in our early times, we did, um, we, did we prepared some collinium-based uh, polyelectrolytes uh, and so polyionic liquids. Uh, and of course that we had all the problems that we have with collinium uh, ionic liquid that uh, sorbs, it, Water, a lot of water. water. Uh, so uh, we had all the, all those properties. Uh, so it would not uh, the applications would be much limited because it absorbs very much water. Um, so they they do not have mechanical properties because they just break. They are very um, flexible on one side, but they very very easily they just turn into the liquid. They break easily, and that's why we yeah. abandon on that. And I regarding the, um, I don't know if someone has another question or another doubt regarding uh, the presentation. Hi, Margarita. Yes, I, I can't. I don't know where to raise my hand. Um, I, uh, <laughs> Sorry, um, Nick, go ahead. No, no, I, I can't find the button to hand raise. So I'm doing it in person, but I guess you can't see me. Okay. Okay. Um, so I was wondering uh, two questions mainly. Uh, one I think is quite standard for this kind of thing is what is the influence because you mentioned this a bit of water on your separation and I'm assuming what are maybe a bit hygroscopic membranes considering the amount of ionicity. No, no, no. Th these, these are not hygroscopic membranes uh, in the sense that you can leave them to the air um, and uh, because we leave them uh, in our lab, we don't have any special care. Although when we start doing the experiments, we always vacuum them, okay? So they are, they do not have water inside of them. Um, and the, in these that have the NTF2 and even the CCN3, uh, we did not find any problems with uh, water problems. Those with collinium, yes. We would prepare the membranes and we would go and have coffee. When we come back, it's uh, just liquid inside of the petri dish. But in terms of your uh, synthetic gas, you keep it completely dry, or do you have water in it as well? Uh, we we kept it completely dry. Yes. So the time lag, um, the time lag uh, uh, experiment, I did not show any time lag experiment. No, only those in the bottom. But the time lag experiment requires you to evacuate to have vacuum uh, on both sides of the membrane before you start. Okay. So we always evacuate the membrane. Those that we did in Santander, uh, we, they, all, they also evacuate the membrane. We were never able to have uh, to put a, a bubbler so that we bubble the gas inside of water and then carry out our experiments. Yes, okay. but that would be a good thing to do. Yes, the results will not be good. I know. <laughs> no, no, just a, just a question, just because with Pedro and so on working, I think they always seem to be struggling with... Uh water in this kind of gas uh, membrane separation. And I guess my second one is more of a curiosity, just because of this um, definition of peels. And uh, for me, it seems to echo a lot um, of the work that is done, for example, in Deakin and stuff on solid state el um, electrolytes for, uh, for lithium batteries. 
And I was wondering if you could uh, say if it was similar or dissimilar in that sense. Um, I, you know, uh, solid state would be great because the liquid state drips. Mm -hmm. So solid state would be very nice. The fact is that uh, we uh, we have come uh, we have been improving a lot on the solid state uh, electrolytes for batteries, but liquid state it's still better. And I think what uh, now the hot topic in terms of electrolytes is gels. Yeah, but in so terms of your your membranes and so on, it's just yours are maybe longer molecular weights compared to the ones that are being trialed for these kind of solid states. Uh, or because I'm, I'm seeing a lot of these uh, polymers, functionalization, uh, NTF2, uh, anions, for example. There seems to be a lot in the, the structure, at least, that seems to be similar to your uh, gel. Yeah, they, they are all very similar in structure, and I mean, and then in the end, they all dope everything with lithium NTF2, <laughs> right? And what uh, carries the charges is the lithium and the NTF2. Um, so the polymer is there only to hold the lithium NTF2 and to provide it and to, co to be compatible with it so that I can dissolve a lot of lithium NTF2, which would not happen with a regular polymer because they would not be compatible, it would segregate. Yeah. Um, uh, but there have been some advances in, uh, in, the, pol in the solid state polymer electrolytes. However, I think that uh, the way to go is through the gel state. And how do you prepare the gels? With ionic liquids and a little bit of polymer. Yeah. Just to give it the, the, if you want a soft gel, if you want a hard gel, uh, I think that is the way to go. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. even, even for membranes for gas separation, because we really would like to have is to have liquids. Yeah. But uh, I cannot have a liquid membrane, so I have to make it solid. But then when it is a solid, I want to put inside a lot of ionic liquid. Yeah. So I just yeah. want something to hold the ionic liquid. And so far, polyionic liquids are the things that hold better large quantities of ionic liquid. But in that case, how does your approach compare, for example, to encapsulated ionic liquids or these kind of things where you have a solid support in which purely by surface tension alone, you have these kind of uh, ionic liquid and liquid state inside. Um, uh, yeah, encapsulated uh, ionic liquids, I think, are good. It is a good strategy to overcome the uh, viscosity barrier. Um, however, they need a support. You need to have a column and to fill the mm -hmm. column, right? And when you fill the column, then uh, you have some problems with the surface area. So probably you'll have to spread them. Uh, I don't know. But that you shouldn't ask to me, you should ask to Professor Pedro Carvalho. No, 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 it's just out of curiosity because I'm not uh, very familiar with all this. Um, well, I'm not as familiar Good. as I would like to be, and it's just out of uh, curiosity and discussion. But uh, thank you, yeah. I'm, I'm just, I'm just uh, uh, picking up on him. Yeah, yeah well, now with his new baby, you, know, you, you see him less and less, so you have to ask the questions uh, somewhere else. <laughs> can always ask me every question, Nick. Yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but thank you, um, Professor. You're welcome. I don't know if someone has the last question or the last questions. Hey, thank you for Professor, once again, for the nice presentation and the nice hot topic, and especially for the presentation, the the, the beginning uh, that you mentioned your your path is really important for us to have some some insight. Thank you so much. Uh, you're welcome. I think it's. Uh, let me just say this to finish. Um, it is always really important to do what you think it's best for you and uh, take some advices, but always do what you think it's best for you. Uh, they will tell you that uh, that is not the best way to go, but uh, if you're good, everybody will recognize that you're good. Everybody will recognize the excellence of your work. <laughs>